Place Vancouver have never won. They've been outscored 7 to 20 at BMO Stadium and they shot themselves in the foot and there was some one there was a wonder strike in there as well, which we'll get to in a minute. But overall takeaways here. Crazy things happened in this competition, but it's hard to see a way back into this tie for Vancouver Whitecaps having to go to BMO Stadium next week and coming away with the result. 10 minutes of madness. Like really. The first half, shoulda, woulda, coulda. We broke it down at halftime. LAFC were not at their best. They didn't have a shot on target. Vancouver Whitecaps threatened multiple times on the counterattack. That final ball breaking out of the back wasn't good enough. Nowhere near good enough. Just completing basic passes. When to carry, when to distribute. The decision making was exceptionally poor. In the second half, LAFC still looked a little bit loose defensively. Vancouver punched and had a couple chances over the first five, ten minutes. Then essentially the wheels fell off. They conceded one, it went to three. It could have been four, five, or six in this game. They just lost their composure. And the, by the time that Betcher and Ahmed came into the game, I mean, they were waiting to come into the game as the second goal was scored. The, the game was really done and dusted at that point. There was no way back in. This was a huge missed opportunity mm. because this wasn't the LAFC that was firing with all cylinders in the first half. No. So, <laughs> Whitecaps, all they needed to do was, well, okay, if you don't score first half, you go even our head at half. But second half, come out with something. Come with some life. Come with a little one-two punch. Get some shots on target. Get in their half and try to play. This lackluster, slow tempo second half that they came with, this is not a, a team that's, that could go far or look like they want to go far in the Champions League. This is a Champions League, baby. Like, this is, a, this is a clear opportunity. You're playing the best team, I would say, in CONCACAF, and you have them, and you kind of just gave some little, little self soft punches. Self-inflicted wounds at the back. And the hold-up play, the attacking play, Adam, nowhere near good enough to play against teams like this. Now, perhaps playing like this is suitable when you're going up against CF Montreal right now, a team in transition that has some serious questions about their squad, and they yeah. go down to 10 men. That's fine. But this is the reason why the Whitecaps haven't been winning games this year on a regular basis. Too many mistakes at the back and not enough cutting edge and attack, whether that's on the coach, there are a lot of people that don't think that he's playing the right players in the right way. Uh, that's fair. You know, th that criticism is fair. But what about this team? Is this team, the squad that is good enough to compete against the best of the best, not only in Major League Soccer, like this is a competition that you're going to be playing the best teams in the region. Yep. I, I think it's a little bit of a wake-up call and maybe a little bit, I called it a litmus test game coming into tonight. Perhaps we're getting a clear indication of the level that the Vancouver Whitecaps are at. Right? I think one thing to mention as well is, yes, we could talk about tactics. I think maybe up front got it wrong today. Looking at Brian White, gave the ball away a little bit too much. Probably needed Betcher around him to create. I would say to start, so you're right with that, Wheels. But also, let's just scrap tactics. Talk about bravery and courage. You're just hoping to kick the ball forward and create something and make something happen. What about having a little bit of poise and pizzazz and saying, hey, let's keep it or let's try to possess the ball in their half? And I didn't see that from the Whitecaps. There, there is some growing to do, though. Um, you know, he, he named a more experienced team here tonight. But LAFC, even though they weren't playing, didn't play their best game through, what, the first 50 minutes or so, no. they were still... There was still, like, composure. There was no panic. They're comfortable. They, they were comfortable throughout the game. And they're supposed to be playing at Vancouver. I mean, we'll get into the atmosphere. We'll get into all of that. But it, it, they, they just really didn't test LF, LAFC tonight. And that's where I think they'll, they'll be kicking themselves at the end of the day. Well, Benny Sartini had made four changes to his 11 before this match. One of those changes was the return, the highly anticipated return of Ryan Gould. Here are the Scotman's thoughts after the match. Right, so after a pretty even first half, what, what went wrong in the second half there? Uh, they just had a 10 or 15 minute spell where they, um, they got the better of us in every aspect of the game. Uh, I think they were better than us technically, tactically, physically. Um, you know, we were second best. Not the result you wanted at home in the first leg, but what positives can you take out of this match that you might be able to build on for, for the second leg on Tuesday? Uh, it's tough to take any positives from today. Um, you know, we'll have to watch the game back and see where we went wrong and, you know, try and try and fix those those mistakes that we made if, uh, if we're to stand any chance of getting a result. Good luck on Tuesday. Thank you. Well, a frank assessment from Ryan Gold, and yes, he said a 10 to 15 minute spell where LAFC just had the better of them and were better in every single way. It's pretty 
honest, it's pretty blunt from Ryan Gold, and it was the three in nine minutes that really was the undoing of this team. And I think that's where it's going to be the most frustrating, I think, Jordan, for Vanny Sartini here when you think about the fact that they were better in chunks, or at least LAFC wasn't the best, but the fact that they weren't able to capitalize. So when it finally came around for, for LAFC, like we just saw, or like we will see in a moment here, that um, they just didn't have their moment of magic. As I said, missed opportunity, and this was a time where if, if you're going to play at LAFC, this was a time to beat them. But this was a time to go and maybe go 1-1 type of game or 0-0 or 1-0 for, for the Whitecaps and then take care of next week. Now you're going to next week, and it's not even an uphill battle. It's, it's basically done in dusted wheels. Well, you have Portland on Saturday. You have Austin the week after that. Like this, this, It's a difficult schedule upcoming for, for the Whitecaps. So... I, it, it, it might be a situation where you don't play your first team regulars in that game next week and you hate to throw in the towel just like that but on the balance of it like Sifuentes didn't play tonight Chiellini didn't play tonight for LAFC it's like they ended up dialing things back at the end of the game so it, it, you know it, it, it's just a frustrating night like you know the question what positives can you take what po None. Like, he's yeah. right. Like, there, there's not much to take from this. But I do think it's decision-making time for Vanny Sartini. He handed another start to Christian Dahomey tonight. He has gone now 19 games, dating back to last season, without scoring a goal. I mean, he's one of your attacking three. If, if, if you're Gauld or any player that's trying to build some... Like, where are the reliable goals coming from? Like, they've been coming off the foot of Betcher, not in the 11 tonight. Brian White isolated, alone, ineffective when he was on the ball. His hold-up play wasn't good enough. So where are those attacking options? Like Tristan Blackman or when they bring up players for set pieces looks like their best <laughs> way the forward, time, right? right? Like that's when they look most dangerous on the game. So I, I think that Sartini and his staff need to take a hard look at some of the players um, and no more based on age or reputation or experience. you got to play the players that are most productive right now. And some of the players that were on the field tonight – simply do not fit that category. And Wheels is talking about productivity, but it's also about just energy. Let's just break it down to that. Just coming on and throwing their body about. That's what Betcher does all the time. You look at all of his goals. He's just really, yeah, his movement is great, but he's, it's his desire to get on the end of things. Yeah. And that's what you need. And that just, that's infectious without, uh, throughout a squad. So this little lackluster one foot in, one foot out that I saw tonight, it's not the way forward for Whitecaps. This is a team that has enough to be dangerous or to have a successful season, but they just need to get the right pieces going. And it looks like the young guys could be that right now. But at the, at the end, you look at it, levels. There's different levels here. <laughs> to be LAFC, to beat them, I mean, they're up here right now. The, the champs of MLS, one of, if not the best team in CONCACAF. They're deep, they're, they're talented, they have weapons at every position. That's what you need to compete at this level. And other MLS clubs, there's a lot of teams in this league through expansion right now. Are you going to be one, you know, in the bottom third? Are you going to be in the middle third? Or are you going to actually push on to compete against teams like that? There is a serious gap right now between those teams. Well, on the topic of weapons, let's talk about one of them for LAFC next, and that's Dennis Buwanga. He'd go on to have a brace, but let's start with his first marker of the night just before the hour mark. And he's starting the play, Jordan. He's finishing it, and then when he finally gets on the receiving end of the attacking third, it is an absolute wonder strike from the Gabon International. Like, I watched his highlights before the game uh, with Lee Earn. I was saying, man, what a Whoa. strike. The goals that he scored, the highlight reel that he has, this is a hit. We discussed wheels in the studio. Like, could Kataka could do much better than that? But it's swerving. It's struck with venom. The two central midfielders both stepped a little bit too slow. They, that, I'm not sure if they were sure what the player was going to do from 35 yards out. You're wondering, could the goalkeeper have done better? Uh, Takaoka is not the tallest goalkeeper. Um, he maybe could have got a touch, but that's a great strike. Even though it's down the middle, it's swerving, it's dipping, it, it, it goes off in bar down. It, it, it's an absolute class strike from an outstanding player. Because I'm not even going to lie to you. That's one of those shots where I'm defending and I'm just kind of putting a foot and saying, shoot from there. That's fine. Yeah. Most of the time you see it go over Jenko. You see it go wide. It hits someone. You're like, he's not scoring from here. But, boy, he hit that. 
Yeah. You hit that if you're going to beat a goalkeeper well, from that far out, that's yeah, the way you to tip do your Because that's a good 30, 35 yards. He smacks that. Well, you're defending with both feet on the ground, not your stomach on the ground. <laughs> that, and you're still not going to do much. On the other side of the spectrum. Aaron Long could have saved it. That's exactly what I'm going after. But on the other side of the spectrum was a self-inflicted wound from the Vancouver Whitecaps. Just a few minutes later, Gareth, and look, it's always dangerous when you play it out of the back like this and just go forward with the press that we saw from LAFC for much of this match, but they got to do better here. Jordan and I talked about this because I do not like this pass that the goalkeeper made. And Kubas is showing, and he called for it a little bit, but I think that nothing good happens when you play that ball down the middle, especially when it's not told to the player which way it can turn. Like, Kubas, it's a lazy touch, right? Like, it's, it's a loose touch. It's nowhere near good enough. But I don't like the initial pass, pass of the goalkeeper, whether it's a Whitecaps goalkeeper, whether it's, uh, whether it's Real Madrid, Barcelona, the best teams in the world. I just do not like that pass. I prefer it to go to the fullbacks. Then they can play it inside. At least it's played at an angle. Well, Wheels, you also brought up a great point in the studio. You said that you don't like that it's square. It's straight square, on. Straight on. And I agree. It should come at an angle. But Kubas, he has the quality to check his shoulder. And he actually does check his left shoulder to look and be open. When you take that right foot, if that's a left foot swing, no one's going to yell at you, buddy. But you can't have the ball stuck under your feet. And that's what happens when you don't really take care of business. Because I think he was a little bit to the left. Naturally, you want to turn left. Instead, yeah. he was forced back in the middle. It was a sloppy touch. Again, I just don't like that initial pass. Great. And I, I see why so many teams, when they set up their press that way, allow that ball to be played because it's very difficult on the player that's receiving it. You play that position. Yeah. I play that position. I hated getting the ball in that position. It's, it's something also to be said now that a lot of keepers feel that you have to overplay. You want to build mm -hmm. from the back. Sometimes it's okay if it goes 60 yards from your goal. That's okay because it's not in the back of your net. But if you try to play the cute pass or maybe not the obvious pass to the center back, those are the things that could happen. Well, it wasn't going to be the most glamorous goal that he ever scored, but one he will take, essentially putting this match to bed. Let's hear from that goal scorer now before we move on to Buwanga's second. Like when you finally got that first goal collectively there in the 55th minute, uh, did you feel the team had a few more goals in them? Yeah, we do. We do. Uh, we could score more, but uh, in the end, we have three goals, which is important. Our win, which is important. We are grateful for the win. So. How much of the relief is it to, to know that you're bringing a three-goal aggregate back to BMO on, uh, on Tuesday for the second leg? Well, it's, it's really important to get three, three points and three goals. And so we're going back home, so we, we're ready to, to finish back home. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, good luck. Thank you, man. <laughs> Apoku rightfully fired up after that result and I think Dennis Buwanga will also be equally excited. He did complete his brace just again another five minutes later to make it three goals and likely but not impossibly to bed. Let's take a look at the final goal now for LAFC and this this Jordan is a death blow to Vancouver at least from a confidence perspective because it just seems like everything's slipping away from them at this point. <laughs> this this was it man. This is the nail in the coffin. The third one really puts it away. But again, like oh. having numbers around uh, Boanga, but not guys ready to commit and make a block here. He's dancing around. Look at this. He gets able to do a Cruyff and then rifle on top cheese. I know how you feel about the, the keeper there, Wheels, but you could definitely add in. Yeah, well, he turned into three Whitecaps defenders, and he made one move, and the three defenders went the other way. It was a rough night for Javane Brown, but you need to read that. You know that if the player turns back, then that's the only way forward. You have two other players to the inside. When you're a fullback in that position, you want to lead that player into trouble. It was covered off to the right-hand side. To the left, exposed, too much space, top shelf. Boeing is a top, top player. This is a player who just over a week ago played for Gabon, uh, played in a 1-0 victory over Sudan, came back, flew, yeah. and went straight to BMO Stadium in L.A. and played and scored the match winner for LAFC. I mean, th Different this is a top, top player, a difficult customer, but again, levels. Like, when you're going up against the, the top, top strikers in Major League Soccer, the defending needs to be better than that. You cannot allow a player off one move to give himself four or five yards of space. He's going to punish you. More of the story, passive defending gets you exploited. You can't. you got to make a tackle. you got to put your body on the line. Well, with that, let's take a look at the numbers after 90 <laughs> minutes of play here. Our full-time stats. It was two-thirds possession for LAFC after the half. Vancouver clawed back a little bit. They had plenty of shots, but only two of them found target on the night. Just simply not enough offense. Meanwhile, LAFC, of their six on target, they were able to convert on half of them on the way to a massive win away from home. 
We're going to step aside, but when we come back, we will join Ashley Lawrence from France as One Soccer's Oliver Platt had the chance to catch up with the Canadian international superstar as they prepare for their tune-up friendly against Les Bleus. Stick around. Some women's national team chat next on Match Day Live. A new era for Canadian soccer begins today. Experience the emotion of every match. Watch all the highlights, the breaking news, the best debates and analysis. And all the information about the Canadian stars playing abroad. Get access to the best of Canadian soccer from any device. Join the new dawn of an unstoppable game. See the rise on onesoccer.ca. Canada's women's national team look to rebound following an up-and-down showing at the She Believes Cup. Next up, a massive pre-women's World Cup tune-up on European soil as Canada's Olympic champs meet the fifth-ranked French in Le Mans. Join One Soccer on Tuesday, April 11th as a pair of World Cup contenders look to fine-tune ahead of this summer's main event. Sinclair ties the match! It's Le Rouge versus Le Bleu, and it's only on one channel, One Soccer. to Canadian Championship Final. No words, man, no words. Dreams come true. Welcome on in to our One Soccer Studios. You are watching One Soccer Today. Well, next week it'll be Whitecaps and LAFC leg two, but just before the return leg begins, we have the Canadian women's national team back in action from Le Mans, a battle of the fifth and sixth ranked sides in the world. Join us from 2.30 p.m. Eastern time for a full match day live in that match, the final window before the World Cup. Here are Ashley Lawrence's thoughts on getting back together in camp. It's uh, an exciting time uh, being back in camp with this group. Uh, this is our last uh, camp preparation uh, before before the World Cup. Of course, we have the, the pre-camp, um, but we are conscious of uh, the importance uh, of being together, um, of, of taking every day um, as we can to prepare um, and having the game at the end of this camp against France will be a really, really good test for us after the She Believes. Um, so, uh, yeah, we only have one game in this window, but it is giving us the opportunity to, uh, to, to build um, uh, connections, team building, uh, getting in a lot more training sessions that we don't always have the time with more games in, in, in the window. So uh, we're definitely taking advantage uh, as a group, uh, staff and players. Uh, firstly, I just wanted to ask you about Janine Becky. What, what was your kind of reaction to that news? I know a lot of us were, were devastated to hear she'd missed the tournament. And how has the team reacted to, to losing an important player and a, and a big personality as well? Uh, it's it's not easy um, to, to deal with uh, injuries. Um, we know it's a part of the game, but um, uh, to have a, a player like Janine Becky um, get injured, um, I know for myself, and I could speak for the team um, that we're, we're all devastated to learn of that. Um, Janine, with her role on this team, um, um, is such an integral part, um, being a leader on and off the field. Um, and uh, uh, it's, it's a, big, a big void um, for us. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not easy um, being back in, um, but we know that uh, we, we're still headed towards the World Cup. Uh, we have to continue to stay focused uh, to, to switch gears towards that. Um, but uh, 
yeah, we we're always thinking of of the players that uh, that are not here with us that are a part of this journey because for us it's everyone uh, that plays a role that is important um, and that helped us get on that podium at the Olympics um, that helped us uh, um, have success against uh, all, all the opponents that we've played throughout these last um, uh, windows international breaks. Um, so uh, we're we're fortunate to have a group. Uh, of players um, to come in um, and uh, to, to step up, to play in different roles, different positions. Um, so uh, we're just, again, taking it one day at a time and uh, uh, we're looking to uh, every player to, to step up and to have a voice and to, to play a role both on and off the field. You think it will potentially open up opportunities for, for new players as well? We've, we've started to see, you know, over the past year or two, players like Chloe Lacasse come in and make an impact. You have a new pro in the group now and Amanda Allen as well. Um, are there opportunities? Are you, are you getting the sense in this camp for new players to maybe make their mark? For sure. Um, I think that uh, we have a, we have such a, a good group in that sense um, uh, with uh, young players coming in, newer players, whether it's their only first couple couple of camps, um, uh, we, we're, we're, we welcome them um, and we allow them to come in to, to feel comfortable and, um, and, and to know that uh, they can uh, make an impact no matter what uh, the age, their age, or um, um, as you said, uh, Amanda Allen, Allen just just uh, signing her first professional contract. So we're conscious of that, and we know that, as you said, uh, uh, there there are spots open for everyone. Uh, it's a competitive group, um, and uh, that just pushes everyone else to to step their game up, um, and ultimately brings the best performance out of the team. So. Um, it's it's overall positive, and uh, if we can continue to have everyone with that mindset, uh, it can only um, help us uh, going into uh, a World Cup. I, I would be remiss as well if I, I didn't ask you. Obviously, the She Believes Cup was a challenging camp in in a number of ways for a number of different reasons on and off the pitch. H how is this camp going so far from your perspective as players? Have things kind of been addressed and improved? Are you kind of satisfied with with the working conditions, or is there still work to do there? Yeah, I think that um, since the She Believes, uh, uh, that was a very powerful moment for us, for the team. Um, we wanted to start a conversation, and that's exactly what we did. Seeing the support from Canadians um, was more than what we anticipated, and we're very grateful for that. Um, uh, as of now, it's still in process. Um, there is no um, solution yet. Um, but there have been steps made, steps forward. So um, that's very positive. Uh, and I, we're taking it um, again uh, uh, as, pl as players. Uh, we're uh, in constant communication and uh, uh, with the Federation. And so um, it is continuing to go forward. Um, uh, but as of now, there is no definite um, solution. Um, so, yeah. Um, now being at this camp, it's, it's good. Again, having one game at the end, uh, we're really being able to be together as a group, players and staff, um, and uh, uh, continue to build that connection because that's also a very important element for us is, is um, that team spirit. Um, that's a key, an X factor um, when it comes to uh, major tournaments like the World Cup, like the Olympic Games. So um, we're just... Um, really happy, um, being positive, getting in some, some good training sessions on the field. And then when we have time off the field, we're continuing um, um, to move forward uh, uh, with that, that process. Ashley, I, I really appreciate the time. I'll finish up on, on one here. And the most important, I think, of all, thumbs up, thumbs down to the new kits. What do you think? Ah, definitely. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, we just, uh, we had a quick... Uh, um we're like photo of it but um i believe tomorrow we're going to be doing like photo shoot so we're going to actually see uh the jerseys be able to put them on um but yeah they're really cool um i uh, love the home jersey especially so uh yeah we're going to be looking sharp at the world cup <laughs> our thanks to oliver platt and ashley lawrence more on that tomorrow on one soccer today and hopefully in that friendly we will see the debut of those new kits the red one is sharp
They mentioned the importance there, Jordan, of this being the last proper camp. The, and they're going to get a test in France, the, the fifth-ranked side in the world here. Share some turmoil with the brand-new coach that they're, they've just appointed, Hervé Renard, and, and everything going on in French football. But it's go time now. The World Cup is just months away. What sort of questions or is there a main question you'd like to see answered from this group when they take to the pitch in, in their final true test before Australia? My main question that I, I hope gets answered is just how they're trying to attack the Canadian women. Like, like the pieces that they have, I know Janine Becky's, I know that's a huge piece going into the World Cup, but just what's their identity going forward? Like, how do they want to play football? Are they trying to play link-up play? They're trying to get balls wide and crosses? Like, watch them as she believes. I know there's a lot going on, but I just want to, I want to see a Canadian side that says, hey, this is how they're trying to play, and this is how they're trying to go forward, and this is how they're trying to dominate games. <laughs> I go back to the buildup of the World Cup. They weren't playing their best football. It wasn't like champagne football that they were playing going in, but they were pragmatic in that competition. They grinded out results. And the top teams in the competition had a really difficult time playing against them. Losing Becky, not having that out-and-out -out goal scorer in this team, not being maybe the most complete version of what they could be, I think they got to go back to that. It's about finding a formation, finding a system that complements their best players and moving forward with that. And it might be a little bit different than we've seen over the course of the last year. Adam, you've been front and center calling all of these games. Bev Priestman just tried to play more progressive, you know, players that are better in distribution, better with the ball at their feet. Yeah. Is that going to be the best way forward for this group? Does there need to be a change of formation? Does there need to be a rethink based on who may be available and who's in form right now? So that's what I want to see. What, who's involved in Bev Priestman's plans? This isn't a time to experiment. This is a time to hone in. So what what ways does she tinker? What ways does she make changes to this group? Let's be clear as well. I, I'm saying how they go forward. I'm not saying or suggesting that it should be tiki-taka or this is the way that they need to do things. But to win games, you have to score. When I'm yeah. seeing She Believes Cup, I'm seeing games that happen for, for Canada. There's not a clear way, hey, this is how we're trying to go forward. So for me, this is a game, as you're leading up to the next four and a half months before the World Cup, that you want to see these things uh, being addressed. And what makes it all the more must see is that it is the it's the fact that they have one match in this window. Some nations have gone for two. Beverly wanted to have that bigger camp, get everyone together and and see who can push for those spots because like you mentioned, it's not really time to experiment anymore. This is time to dial in for that World Cup. Well, it is a very busy month, April, in the world of football, especially up here in Canada, because we also have the CONCACAF Gold Cup draw the day before the CPL begins. 3 p.m. Eastern time, noon Pacific. Canada will find out their opponents for the upcoming Gold Cup this summer. So plenty to discuss, just as we will do when we come back for our final few minutes of the show on Match Day Live. A way forward for the Whitecaps. If they want to come back in this competition, they need three at BMO Stadium. We will try and plot that course for Vanny Sartini when we come back to Match Day Live. The new season underway. Absolute class. It's the Golden Boy once again. Oh, very good. <laughs> what a sweet, sweet moment. <laughs> Super goal! championship is bigger than ever with a record 14 clubs set to clash this year for a chance to lift the coveted Voyagers Cup. It has finally arrived. It's a competition that has created some of Canada's most breathtaking football moments. Competition whose big prize includes a berth into the 2024 CONCACAF Champions League. Good cross, Debrian! Watch every match of the 2023 Canadian Championship on one channel, one soccer. Champions again! We created Carlsberg 00 because even the best things can be better. Where our golf we've been. Uh, Clean one-handed backhand is better. 
balancing stuff. It's better. Whatever this is, it's better. We cleared the cosmos. Skipping your own ad. It's better. Parking in space. Better. So, can the best alcohol free beer make good things better? Probably. The odds may be stacked against them, but there's still a second leg for the Whitecaps to play. Fire up some positivity here, folks. Leg two, April the 11th. That is a 7.15 p.m. Pacific kickoff. They need to score three goals. If they concede one, they need four. The math is certainly not in their favor. Gareth, if you were a betting man after our discussion in the pregame show, would you say that Simon Betcher starts leg two? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. <laughs> it, because... I would have expected him to start tonight. Mm. And if you're playing a second Does team, he and if Betcher's going to go back-to-back -back against Portland, then Austin the following weekend, we'll see. I, I, don't, I, I kind of feel like it's an important game this Saturday that they need to get through against Portland. If they get smashed against Portland at home, what does this mean for Vanny Sartini? I think that this is less about Betcher and some of the players. Um, but no one on that coaching staff can feel good about the way things are going. <laughs> you can't feel good. But Wheels, I know I, I'm sometimes a king of cliches, but you're only as you good are? as your last. Yeah, a little bit. You're only as good as your last game. This game was not the greatest. So you got to pick it up. And this weekend is a time for redemption. I'm just looking forward to see what kind of bizarre defensive play we'll have that you can reenact. I mean, we've got the Gareth Wheeler bicycle <laughs> kick. We've got the Jordan Wilson, Aaron Long reenact. I, I hope I don't have to go on my chest and wave yeah. a leg. I, I think that was just one and done, but it, we, it uh, needs to be done. We gave the weekend at Bernie's reference. Yes. Something more to date. Scott Sterling! It's, it's, it's Scott exactly Sterling. It Brilliant. That is precisely Roll what Roll that was. memory for the rest of our life. LAFC, they get three goals. They also get a fantastic clip to go viral. Vanny, sorry. Martini unfortunately gets sent back to the drawing board. You better that make this montage, Adam. The extent right there it is! Oh, there it is! <laughs> Sterling! The extent of the offense, well, it was all LAFC in this one as they cruise to a 3-0 win. For my partners, Gareth Wheeler and Jordan Wilson, I've been Adam Jenkins. Thank you so much for joining us on Match Day Live. One soccer today, tomorrow, and leg two next Tuesday. So long for now. To play, it's something that's in us from the very beginning and something we take with us on every step of the journey. When we have no words, it gives us a way to speak. When we are still finding our way in the world, it gives us somewhere to belong. And no matter who we 